friends, and welcome back to another Office Hours session. This is our final session on Hebrews. We've been moving our way through the book of Hebrews with a number of very distinguished Bible scholars uh, following closely or not so closely to the lectionary text for the month of October and uh, the first couple of weeks of November. And uh, we are joined. My name is Chris Holmes. I'm the scholar in residence at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Uh, and I'm joined, as always, by Brennan Breed, who is an associate professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary. And today we are joined, we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Cynthia Long Westfall, who is a uh, associate professor of New Testament at McMaster Divinity College, uh, which, for those of you that don't know, is in Canada. I, I believe uh, that uh, Dr. Westfall is our second guest from Canada, but maybe we've had more. I know that Matt Tyson who was with us uh, earlier this year, also a Canadian, or also at least at a Canadian institution. Um, and so oh, he's, he's Canadian, we, I think, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go, okay, thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. um, so as always, we are grateful when we are able to get scholars from around the country, or in this case, around the world, to join us for these uh, fun conversational uh, conversations about scripture and about uh, the church. So. Yes. So this week is uh, with, with Dr. Westfall and Cindy, generally we ask our guests, our opening question is the same. And uh, so at the end, we'll have a bunch of different answers, but what are some of the presuppositions or even theological assumptions that you bring to scripture and its interpretation? Uh, what are, you, you know, some, some motivations or some convictions uh, that you might share with our audience? Well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start with my high view of scripture. I have a very high view of scripture as the word of God, and that's just not doctrinal, but that's in authority over my life. And so one of my favorite passages ever is Deuteronomy 32, 47. These are not just idle words for you. They are your life. And that's how my Christian walk started with having my life saved through the word of God. So one of the things that really motivates me is to apply myself to the study of passages that don't seem to make sense with the presupposition that the Bible was written to be coherent. And so I guess that in some way relates to the doctrine of the perspicuity of the Bible, the clarity of scripture. That's why I got into Hebrews, because most people said, I don't understand Hebrews. It doesn't <laughs> make sense. And even the right. scholars, you know, say, I don't yeah. know what's going on here. And so uh, I thought, well, this is, this is great. Let's see if this can be read coherently and we're just missing it. And so that, that really has driven a lot of my work uh, in general. And all my work starts with the text of the Bible itself. I'm generally paying attention to the details and how the details relate to the entire text, such as the entire book of Hebrews. So if I'm looking at grammar, a word, a phrase, or a sentence, I'm working at understanding it in the context of its paragraph, its section, and the book as a whole. So that extends to understanding the text in its context, situation, historical context, and the culture. But I always start with the text. And I'm most interested in what the message is. What's the point that God is making through the author in this text? And mm -hmm. so in, in a word, that's a, a certain application of what we call a discourse analysis that's based on linguistics. Somehow I'm always doing discourse analysis or I'm influenced by it and by linguistics in my work. Wonderful. Yeah, I, love, I love it. And I love the connection that you made in your explanation in between discourse analysis, which is not necessarily like a theological or a Christian thing, but how it connects with your uh, very sort of Christian theological orientation of scripture and how the two uh, connect. That's super, that's super enlightening. So yeah. thank you. And uh, one thing we usually always ask of, uh, of folks on the show is that uh, we ask uh, what we know that you are an expert on Hebrews. Uh, what are you working on now? Or what sort of questions um, are animating your thought at, uh, at this moment? Is there anything you're working on in particular that you're looking to for the future or anything you put out recently that you'd like to, um, to let us know about? Well, I'm competing. Uh, I'm completing. I am competing. No, I'm completing. <laughs> Uh, the commentary on Hebrews in the New Covenant commentary series, which might be really interesting for your listeners, because its goal is to make scholarship accessible as a really trying. And I'm also completing the Baylor handbook on the Greek New Testament for Hebrews. That's going to be a little later. Um, and I'm working through a, a commentary on Daniel and the Septuagint. 
Wonderful. Cool. I love that. Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and on, the, and a, on another note, and now for something completely different, I'm a co-editor for the third edition of Discovering Biblical Equality with IVP Academic that's going to be released oh. uh, November 2nd. Wow. Very now cool. here it's out in hard cool. or it's out in copy now. It's already out. Okay. But uh, November second's the uh, official day. Great. Well, Let's you have been remember. very busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and are yeah. continuing to be very busy. I'm sure. <laughs> That's yeah. Right. That's right. No, no time for rest during COVID. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> in any event, uh, thank you again so much for joining us and for sharing your wisdom with us uh, here. Uh, so last time uh, we talked with David Moffat um, about uh, Hebrews chapter nine, and so we talked a little bit about uh, this difference between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary, talked a little bit about um, sketchy or shadowy uh, tabernacles uh, versus uh, the real thing uh, and this kind of image or pattern uh, that was shown to Moses um, and uh, some of the different kinds of thinking uh, that that are motivating this kind of argument that the author of Hebrews uh, is engaging in here. Um, and now we come to uh, a, a pretty uh, decisive moment uh, in the book of Hebrews about Jesus and about the whole high priestly message metaphor and about the sanctuary metaphors that have been going on, um, but also about uh, about heaven, what's been, what's actually been happening now. Um, but uh, uh, is there anything that you'd like to fit in here uh, to the larger argument of Hebrews? Now, we all understand Hebrews a bit differently because it is a difficult book. Uh, it's it's an a enlightening book and a, in many ways a, a fascinating book, um, but also uh, everybody we've, ha we've had on to talk about it constructs the book a bit differently. So is there anything before we get up to chapter 10 that you'd like to put in place for us in chapters one through nine that help us to understand why the author goes here at this moment and what the author is really trying to say. Right. Well, this is my thing right here. And I'm probably going to go ahead and put the whole thing, uh, go back and back and talk about it right through the passage about how this is fitting together. Um, yeah. I just love that question. At first, I should probably frame what I'm going to say with stating that it's helpful for us to think of Hebrews as being a sermon to a specific group of people. So every once in a while, I'll talk about the sermon, and we're, we're going to be looking at exhortation here. Mm -hmm. It's sermonic. And so um, this is a very, uh, a very widespread belief that Hebrews was actually written as a sermon, written to be read out loud, and appeals to the ear. And uh, there's particularly uh, when we have these hortatory subjunctives ringing like we do in uh, 10, 19 through 22, it really gets, it really gets the ear. Mm -hmm. So we're still talking, when we get to the beginning of, of Hebrews 10, we're still talking about Jesus as the high priest of our confession. We won't be talking about it when we get to the later part of chapter yeah. 10. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was first introduced as the high priest of our confession in 2.17. And then in a kind of an indirect, in some ways indirect, in some ways more of an e exhortation to pay attention to this teaching. In chapters five, six, and seven, the author explains in detail that Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, hmm. which is kind of news at this point. I, I think we can take this as a brand new thought and a brand new idea that he spends a lot of time on hmm. to, con to convince people who are steeped in the Old Testament that the fact that uh, Jesus doesn't belong to the tribe of Levi is not a problem with what he's yeah. saying. But right. they would have thought it was a problem until we get to chapter five and he starts explaining why it's not mm -hmm. uh, in a long explanation. So then w the author gives an orientation to further discussion of Jesus as high priest in 8, 1 through 13. And in 8, 1 through 13, he indicates that the service of Jesus the Messiah as high priest is directly related and corresponds to virtually, you can push back on this, but virtually all the, the major symbols and institutions of Judaism, except the land perhaps, uh, which are the Levitical priesthood, the Mosaic tabernacle, the Mosaic covenant, and the Le Levitical sacrificial system. So then in the following passages, he's breaking out each thing. In 9 through 14, he talks about Jesus's service as high priest in relationship to the, to the tabernacle and expands what he said in um, 8, 1 through 13. Then in 9, 15 through 28, the author relates Jesus's priestly service to the covenant. And then in 10, 1 through 18, Jesus's priestly service is related to the sacrificial system. 
And so he's he's drawn on all of these, you know, say yanking the chains here mm-hmm. of, of <laughs> all these major symbols of Judaism, and then explains how Jesus's high priesthood is relating to each one. And then in 10, 19 through 22, all the teachings on Jesus's priesthood come together. And what do they do, though? They come together to support the exhortation to the readers to follow Jesus into the Holy of Holies. Hmm. So in 414, right before he hopped into the discussion on Melchizedek, he exhorted them to draw near to the throne of grace uh, with confidence to receive mercy and grace in their time of need. So he's gone through this whole section where he explains how Jesus can be a high priest because of the order of Melchizedek. Listen up. This is going to be important. He even says in chapter at the end of chapter six, this is going to get you. This is going to draw. This is the anchor that if you hang on to it, it's going to draw you behind the curtain. And so there, it continually relates back that this is about this is about you. This is about this is about moving you forward spiritually. This is about moving you on to maturity. And then he gets, therefore, to um, 10, 19 through 22, and it's a major climax, really the climax in the book, where he tells them something that would be unthinkable without all this previous explanation. He wants them to go in, not just to the earthly tabernacle, into the heavenly tabernacle, into the most holy place, because they can follow Jesus in because of everything he's done for them. So all the teaching on Jesus's high priesthood has equipped them and given them confidence. Confidence is a big word to do just that. That is now they are called to function as priests in the heavenly tabernacle. Hmm. And he's just built it for them in every way, uh, way, shape and form that one can possibly do in this, in this small space. And he's built the tabernacle, he's built the tabernacle for them and given them all the associations they need to actually do this thing with faith and to visualize it. Would it be fair to say that, uh, that Hebrews 10 provides us really the center piece of the argument of the book of Hebrews. This is, this is the crescendo. And, and after this, we get a lot of reflections on this point from the other side. Um, but, but that this is, this is the, 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 the climax. Well, and I would say 19 through 25 is the climax. Um, although the sacrifice, the fat sacrifice element is exceedingly important. Mm-hmm. And I think quite poignant in um, in the place in which we place Hebrews, uh, very close to the destruction of the temple. Probably, probably it's a, it's inevitable or it's happened at the point mm-hmm. that Hebrews is written. And mm-hmm. so, just like the rabbis did, um, you know, the rabbis said, "What do we do without a temple? How do we live?" This is really what the Hebrews writer is doing for what I would suggest is for uh, Jewish Christians in the faith, primarily directed towards them. They're the ones that have all these questions and that to whom it would mean something uh, deep, you know, deep and important. And so th- this this idea of you know, the sacrifice um, actually was once and for all is is something that's exceedingly important to move forward with. But then what does he do with it? And I I would say that what he does with it is the point of the sermon, even though the theology is incredibly important and how it relates to, you know, all the ways in which Judaism has dealt with purity and and sacrifice and sin. Um, But, um, and and to to just say the whole uh, section of uh, 19 through 25 is, is climactic because uh, he just doesn't say draw near to God. He says, let's draw near to God. Let's hold on to the confession. Let's stimulate one another to love and good works. And I could paraphrase that. Let's move forward spiritually. And this is the exact thing he's been saying through the whole epistle. And he said those very three things in, um, in uh, 4, 11 through 16. He said the same thing, draw near to, but he said it in a different order. Yeah, he said, yeah. enter the rest, which is move forward, uh, hang on to the confession and draw near to God. Now he repeats them. And so, you know, some people like to call that a chiasm. I'm good with just calling it repetition. You know? <laughs> I guess it's repetition yeah. in linguistics, right? It's being yeah. used effectively yeah. and it's being used obviously that this, uh, that this very distinctive form is let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And it's very emphatic in um, both places. And so 
it, the last command that says, let's stimulate each other to what love and good works, that kind of explains why, you know, that's kind of giving us the shift that's happening here, because you can't really say all of chapter 10 is about Jesus as a, as a high priest, because the high priesthood disappears at this point. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, what you have in um, 10, 26 through 39 is after saying, let's move forward, let's stimulate each other to love and good works, the author warns against going backwards. And uh, to sin here is regression. And at best, in, in 12.1, it's, it's immobilization, right? It's going to stop you from running the race. But he's really picturing it as regression here, going backwards. And when Jesus comes, he's not going to be pleased with people who are going backwards. Or as it says, he shows up and you're shrinking back. That's not okay. And so that's how we're putting the uh, book together, uh, at least the, uh, the central section together up to chapter 10. I think one of the things when I've taught Hebrews in a seminary context in the past, I've, I've tried to impress upon my students is that one of the challenges of reading Hebrews is holding together chapters one through four, roughly, and chapters, the second half of chapter 10 through 13 with that central section. That, that, that's the greatest challenge is to connect the sort of the speculation about the priesthood and, and priestly service of Jesus with what is uh, on the bookends uh, very like it seems more more like life on the ground it's worried about gathering together it's worried about mm -hmm. offering sacrifices it's much more hortatory language and what i what i what i love about your your response was that focus on the community you said you know this is a, a sermon to a real community and i wonder especially in this language of verse 25 of of not neglecting meeting together if you know, what is that connection for you between uh, this sort of speculative uh, or theological or Christological reflection on Jesus as high priest and sort of like how that connects with the community on the ground and the and the message and the exhortation that follows? Yeah, well, you know, you're exactly talking about uh uh, places that carry things that if you miss, you're going to miss so much. And all of these three things hang together. And I would suggest the exhortations are part of the thing that hangs them together. I have another uh, thought that I might help you with that, with the, uh, putting those together. But the thing is, all through Hebrews, um, there's, there's a, we miss sometimes the pastoral note that keeps going over and over again. I just taught on Hebrews 3 this morning. And speaking of hard places for people to follow, you know, one of my students said, you know, these were just, this was just in pieces. And, but, but by the end of class, you saw how it hung. And it is. And, I, and the, there's a reason for that. I think that um, sections are mislabeled. People get, get thrown off on bunny trails and they can't ever get back to what the point is. But in, in um, uh, Hebrews 3, for instance, you know, after he sits there and gives this dire warning, like, you know, gives these parallels of, with the wilderness generation, he concludes it with saying, make see to it be, be terrified be afraid that one of you might miss this and mm -hmm. and before he gets that he says he says you got to exhort one another you got to encourage each other daily while it's still called today and then and then then the conclusion is make sure that not one of you misses it um yeah. and even following the race when it talks about um you know strengthening the arms and strengthening the legs that's a one another concept so all through hebrews it's not every person for themselves but it, it's very much look to the other person exhort each other don't neglect each other um and this that this is not an individual contest or struggle or race this is a group event and we want everyone to get a prize in this one <laughs> Well, and then we hear yeah, the running love, analogy that comes back in chapter 12, right? Yeah, that yeah right, Jesus is the right, author right. of our faith. I wrote a chapter called No One Left Behind <laughs> and, and, yeah. and talked about how this is just such a dominant theme running through Hebrews, this pastoral element. And so that goes right with the idea of not neglecting meeting together, that the importance of community and making it through what I judge to be a very serious crisis that's comparable to what the wilderness generation faced, which is... Mm -hmm. A big crisis when they we were really in, in chapter eleven, right? Yeah, this crisis. Majority. Well, yes, well, crisis after crisis, dark times, death and dying, 
and sojourning outside of the land of the promise, um, ending up with this really dark thing about people being sawn into and killed and everything, and yeah. the world wasn't worthy of them. I think that that is written to relate to the circumstances that the readers are facing. They are facing, as I say it, death, enslavement, or forced migration. Yeah. No choices beyond that. And in the community, I would suggest probably did not make it. I mean, in terms of the the location ceased to exist. We lost all the envelope on for information, you know, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. When there's forced migration and that kind of thing, you lose things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I think that is related to this concept of no one left behind and encouragement is... Uh, the Greek word hypomone, which means endurance, or you know, th there's a variety of, of words that we might translate it for, and it's it first occurs in chapter ten, and I would think that I think that that the, this idea of endurance is really a thread that we see throughout chapters eleven, twelve, and thirteen as sort of a characteristic value for this community. And so I wonder if you could say a few words about about endurance uh, in chapter ten or eleven and twelve or what does endurance mean and 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 what is it how does it relate to the overall message of Hebrews? Well, I think you've said it that uh, that the concept is illustrated through all the examples in chapter eleven that the uh, the intent is to illustrate the endurance uh, from the of the ancestors um, and in which they faced in, in dire circumstances. And what's interesting is I mean the circumstances that they bring up in, uh, that the author brings up in eleven aren't necessarily what you would expect, for instance, for Joseph and Moses. Uh, when, when you think about Joseph and you think of all the faithful things he did, having his bones carried back to um, the <laughs> promised land is not on top on my list, but it's big, in, it's, it's big in Hebrews. Why is that? And Moses, the same thing. What are you going to stress about uh, the, the, his faith in, in his life? Not precisely what was stressed. And so, you know, I think the author was picking and choosing the stories that he was talking to that, that are going to relate to endurance in, in the face of death. Endurance in the face, mm -hmm. face of death or in the face of, you know, some kind of a serious displacement. And so, um, th so the whole thing is, even though, you know, if you scan Hebrews 11, you're not going to really find endurance. When you see endurance pop up, I want you to run the race with endurance. It's this kind of endurance. It's the kind of endurance that that group that experienced uh, such um, such oppression that he that he that he climaxes that chapter with, um, it, it characterized in their behavior. Now you run that race in, with endurance, and you run that race with the endurance that Jesus sh uh, showed when he endured hostility from sinners. The same thing, keeping your eyes on Jesus who endured. And then the whole uh, discipline and endurance chapter is a big piece. But I wanted to say that this isn't the first time it's come up in the book in terms of a concept. But it's this verse that we hit in chapter 10 is directly related to macrothumia, which is endurance with patience. And it comes up in 6, 12 through 15. I could read it, but I'm going to, I'm going to just paraphrase it because we've got, you know, I, I realize we're time sensitive, where he says almost the same thing. We want you to have endurance so that you can inherit the promises. And then he's, yeah. he talks about Abraham's endurance that inherited the promises uh, directly after that. So it's the same thing. I, actually, you'd say if this were two texts, there was intertextuality. And he um, that is to mean a relationship between the texts. And he was using different words, but words that are um, synonyms. They bring out different aspects where you say maybe uh, hupomane is, is the idea of staying power, where um, macrothumia is more of the idea of patience. And, but they come together into, into stressing the same thing. And then in, in, um, there's that holding on to the confession, lest we drift away. That's perseverance. Uh, that's perseverance mm -hmm. in a specific sense. And then uh, for uh, chapter three, uh, holding on in the same sense, hanging on for dear life to our confidence and hope so that we can maintain our partnership with Jesus. So this is not a, this concept is not a stranger to the book as a whole. This is what he's driving at. This is what he's this is one of the qualities he's trying to produce. It's going to help them to hold on. There's a hold on aspect, but it also is going to move you forward and draw you near. 
Yeah. Well, it's and it's a reminder that the life of faith, according to Hebrews, is is not sunshine and rainbows. That it's a it's a hard life. I mean, I think that's the thing that strikes me. We we sort of already talked a little bit about Hebrews eleven, but the the the, the catalog of faithful in Hebrews eleven. I mean, the the degree to which their response of faith led them into situations of displacement or hardship or threat of death or even death is, a, you know, I think that that, again, speaks to the pastoral situation where it's a community that because of their faith, because of their association with, with the Christian communities are experiencing hardship. And so, so much of it is a rallying cry, of, you know, as you said earlier, get together, hold each other up, uh, run this race together, because it's not hard easy but it but it's worth it that seems to be one of the messages right well and like i said that drives us back to the wilderness generation and he makes this strong parallel we've got to figure that parallels an apt parallel that he's comparing them to a generation who, who really had some great experiences of faith but when it got to crossing the jordan and taking that risk and fighting that 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 was a crisis and and for us to poo poo and oh we wouldn't act that way but no that was quite that was quite a challenge and they failed and so to say that they're experiencing something similar is not too much of a stretch that's got to be an apt parallel yeah very nice very nice well so brennan you were going to say something go ahead i, I interrupt. oh no no uh, yeah i was i was gonna i was gonna actually move us to just uh, asking about um uh the rest of hebrews so yeah great, uh, we, we, we've already talked a little about 11 and 12 and so on but it, what else can we pick up on I mean, you know some people have pointed out that uh, the ending of hebrews is a little bit different than the beginning of hebrews and so on uh to, there picks up a little bit of letter-like qualities at the end and so on um but is there w- w- what can we say about the kind of last few chapters of hebrews uh beyond the focus on faith and endurance uh, that we've pointed out in the kind of catalog of heroes. And of course, everyone's favorite verse in Hebrews, at least that I know of, uh, and that's uh, yeah, chapter cool. 12, um, uh, you know, the, the cloud of witnesses and so on, uh, right. the, the Jesus is the author and perfect of our faith, um, uh, which I'm, I'm assuming people are familiar with, but hopefully this series has given people more of a context for some of those verses that are often taken out and, and memorized individually. Um, but what else can we say about chapters 12, 13, and so on um, that, uh, that, that give us more of a sense of, of how this functions as a whole? Right. Well, I actually, whereas I look at um, 10, 19 through 25 as a climactic, as a thematic climax, that is, it really hits the points, his message, and makes them extremely clear. When you get to 12, that's another climax, and where you're running the race, and not only just running the race, but where are you running the race? And the race is placed in Mount Zion, and there's this very dramatic very dramatic description like you haven't come to mount sinai you know a scary horrible mountain you've come to a party and and it's like and everybody's angels are there too so i don't think angels are as big a problem as as people were painting them out to be and i don't think that's a misunder i think that's a misunderstanding of chapter one to say don't don't pull around with angels you know like no angels are okay they're all here and everybody's there it's a crowded stage what we call a crowded stage in discourse analysis or in narrative criticism too it's a party it's exciting and then all of a sudden it goes very stern when it says uh, that Jesus's blood is speaking, you're, you're drawing near to God and Jesus and his blood is speaking louder than the blood of Abel. Don't resist the one who's speaking to you. And this has been, this has been said in so many ways at this point, but you've got to pay attention. And then mm-hmm. he said, um, let's continue to express our gratitude. And with this gratitude, let's serve God. And it actually, I, I, I had, um, I was a translator for the CEB. I said, serve God as priests, because mm-hmm. I think you, you, you're again in the temple. You're, you're, you're in the priesthood of the believer. And the, and the, and the word is Latruo. It's, it's a, it's a, a technical a word that's used technically for the service of priesthood. And it's mm-hmm. used repeatedly. And I think intentionally in Hebrews, and we've got it here. Let's, uh, let's worship, uh, serve God as priests in a way that's pleasing to God with respect and awe because our God's a consuming fire Mm -hmm. and, you know, and then all of a sudden everyone's going, what happened? What's happening here? I don't get it. And what I would suggest is that once he has framed the priesthood and he's, and he's placed you, he's placed you in the tabernacle and you're in a race and you're in heavenly Jerusalem, back of the tabernacle, still a priest. um, What do you do? What's your service? And these kind of machine gun commands are 
this is your this is your priestly service. Mm-hmm. Keep loving each other like family. Don't neglect to open up your homes. And he gives all of these uh, these um, commands, and then he closes with so. Now think of this in a priestly context. Let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise through him, which is fruit from our lips that confess his name. Don't forget to do good and to share um, what you have. Doesn't that sound like, uh, now we're right back at 10, uh, 1025, you know? Right. Same thing, repeats it. Don't forget to do good and share uh, with what you have because God is pleased with these kinds of sacrifices. I'm suggesting you're the one making the sacrifices. And, and um, you know, the sacrifice for sin and atonement is over, but are the other sacrifices really over or does this correlate to some of the other sacrifices that we see in the Old Testament? Um, that, that we are still, we still have sacrifices to offer. It's the things we're doing in our, our, we live our lives on this earth in which we're confronting the hostility from sinners as a priestly service to God, as if we were, in fact, we are located in the uh, heavenly sanctuary. Hmm. And then he closes it out with epistolary, with epistolary information, because he is writing to real people, even though it starts as a sermon, it ends with, I know you, you know me, you know, and um, a, a little bit of epistolary, uh, that, that pastoral concern and connection. Yep. Wow. Brennan, anything uh, about, about priestly service that you want to sort of tease in uh, before we wrap up our, our very uh, productive and insightful conversation? Yeah, I mean, I really like the situating of Hebrews right at the edge of maybe just after, maybe just before, but it feels inevitable, the end of the of the temple service. Um, it does feel like that to me. Um, it, it is uh, really interesting to me how different Paul, uh, you know, responds and thinks about uh, sacrifice and the tabernacle and temple and like how, how differently he treats that. And the whole notion of Christ's sacrifice, it just, it, sound, it sounds and feels very different. And, and it seems to me like the, the context of right at the edge of losing the temple, or maybe just after having lost it, reframes a lot of the ways that Jews in particular would have thought about, you know, Jews following Jesus in particular would have would have thought about um, what Jesus did, what do we do now, how does this work, and so on. Um, so that, I mean, that's that setting kind of brings that alive to me, but that, 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 um, coming back to and thinking again and again about how is Jesus like the high priest and how is Jesus functioning as a high priest, um, you know, in, in a new day in which the, 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 the priesthood is, is gone effectively. I mean, and we, mm. one thing we know from the Romans is that after the destruction of the temple, I mean, there was wholesale slaughter priests and priestly leaders and, you know, the, the temple itself is raised and destroyed. And um, so imagining in that vacuum, but, but it does, it does seem to me like, you know, Paul seems to be writing in a very different space, two different people um, uh, with different concerns, but it just, it, it does uh, feel so different, the notion of atonement in Paul and in Hebrews. I mean, of course, they're talking talk about the same thing, but, but it does, it, it just, uh, and it just, uh, you know, to me, uh, Hebrews feels much more in touch with uh, the kind of pulse of the Old Testament um, in terms of thinking of Levitical uh, uh, of Leviticus as as a, as a heartbeat of the Old Testament. I mean, I'm a big fan of Jacob Milgram's work in thinking uh, about how sacrifice worked, how blood worked as a, lit- a liturgical detergent, you know, cleaned away uh, sins and so on. But this Hebrews is taking that as a, as a basis or a foundation, but is also saying, how do we think beyond this? Not 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 forgetting these categories or saying they didn't work, but instead moving beyond with them uh, in a way that is, yeah, as you pointed out, um, uh, Cindy, you know, very parallel to, to rabbinic thought in this period that's trying to push beyond and think about new ways uh, to think about sacrifice and the community. Um, but it just, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, yeah. Can I say something? Um, Hebrews is often taken as being anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish and, and saying that it was dish, basic, basically dishing on Judaism. I would say it's doing anything but that. Um, this is this is something that is taking Judaism and moving forward with it, just like the rabbis did, mm-hmm. and but but through the through the lens through the Christological lens, and and in some ways, I think it, it, the the uh, solution in Hebrews is much more uh, founded biblically than the than the rabbinic solution that came up. But but um, the thing is, it's not it's not. Uh, when when you say that the old system, the old covenant was becoming obsolete, that sounds really bad, unless it was. It yeah, unless it was to everyone. Yeah, the fact is it was. And so in 70, 
it all went down like a house of cards and it's never come back. And so if this is dealing with that, there's nothing anti-Semitic about it. It's the work that had to be done by both uh, believe, Jewish believers who followed Christ and those who mm -hmm. did not. And yeah. so stuff like that makes profound theology. It makes right. you think about things differently and see things differently. And you look again and you say, wow. Yeah. And I and I suggest that's what happened. That's what's happening in Hebrews. People try to say, oh no, this was already out there. I don't think so. I think that the situation caused him to do some profound work in the Old Testament. And he exegeted the whole testament. He exegeted space and uh, he came up with something that really pushed the concepts forward. And, and of course, Paul's not going to even going to even come close to talking like that because he's not dealing with these questions in his ministry that's yeah, focused right. on Gentiles. This is a ministry that's focused on Jews. It's answering their questions and um, processing what's happened to them. Yeah. And if we take that away from that context, then it's easy to read this in such a way that might become anti-Jewish or be it used is, for any yeah. Semitic purposes. However, that's why the work of scholars like like your work are is so important uh, and so important for people to to get in touch with because that does help us to contextualize and then understand the truth of, of Hebrews and how it actually works. Yeah, right. Well, and so you have to get down into the Jewish mentality to make it work. You really do. Otherwise, it is so foreign uh, that you can't really can't get through that middle section. <laughs> yeah. Right. If, right. If you don't appreciate what it's dealing with. Yeah. Such a such a good reminder, such a good reminder of some of the interconnections between the New Testament and the Old Testament, why it's important for us to know that, why it's important to know and understand the ancient context. So, uh, well, I'm going to wrap us because we're at just about at time. And once again, uh, Dr. Westfall, thank you so much for giving us some of your time and your wisdom and sharing that with our audience. Uh, and thanks to those of you who have been watching during the week or on Sunday mornings. We hope that these have been generative and fruitful uh, videos, but also things that produce generative and fruitful conversations among you. And we look forward to hearing from you. But uh, thank you so much, Brendan. Thank you, as always. And uh, once again, Cindy, thank you. And we will we'll see you all later. Thank you for having me. Peace, peace, peace.